All right, assalamualaikum everyone. Welcome back to another clinical lecture in the neuro block. Um, so I had a session with you last uh, two weeks ago, تقريباً, and I I wanted to put this, but I was too sick to do so. So this is a brief uh, five minute summary of how you should approach clinical lectures. Um, so let's start. So the rule of thumb. So usually when it comes to clinical lectures, people who give it or doctors who give it are usually doctors and clinicians who are currently in practice and they're usually in the hospital. Now, uh, what ends up happening is that they use the same slides which they give for their residents and they teach it for the medical students. So when it sounds overwhelming, it is overwhelming, but because it's not for your level. So you need to know what to take from each. So the way I want you to approach clinical lectures is I want you to first start patho, pharma, micro, your basics, and then tie them up with your clinical lectures, okay? Um, but when it comes to complex algorithms and diagrams, these are not meant for you. Chances are these are meant for the residents, okay? So it's important to know what to take and what to skip. Now, for example, what usually ends up happening um, a common theme between uh, clinical lectures starting from neuro and going towards your third, fourth, and even fifth year. Um, some things that you need to know are the definitions. So a definition of uh, said disease and its subtypes. And when the disease has subtypes, you really want to know how to differentiate between those subtypes. Not memorize it as much as understand the difference between the different subtypes of these diseases. The second thing is you need to know what each test and what's a positive result in each test? What is the test exactly? And why, why do we use it, okay? And finally, you need to have an idea, a small idea. I don't want you to know the algorithm because this is meant for residents and fellows and even consultants in the field. And it changes every year in conferences and research papers. So just have an idea. Okay, what am I supposed to know? The general idea. And then try to tie it in with your patho knowledge and pharma knowledge. That's it. So clinical lectures are very easy, but you need to know what to study. I'll try to highlight that in today's lecture and keep it as brief as possible. So today's lecture is about brain edema and intracranial pressure. Now, so we're going to first discuss edema. We're going to talk about vasogenic versus uh, cytotoxic uh, edema. We're going to talk about why it happens, what are the causes and imaging for each one of them. Then we're going to talk about some basic physiology. And then we're going to talk about brain herniation, and it's an important topic. And then we're going to talk about idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Now, the reason I wrote this, or rather drew this, is because it's important when you approach a clinical lecture to understand what the lecture is going to be talking about, okay? Unlike patho, patho lectures, which you have to know everything, it's important to create some sort of mental flow chart that will help guide you through the lecture. So, as I said, definitions are very important. Let's define brain edema. So, it's the accumulation of fluid in the brain nothing that you don't know. This leads to increased intracranial pressure. We'll talk about that. And hence impaired the neural functions. As, as you know, the brain is found in a confined space, which is the skull, and there's only limited place for extra pressure. So whenever there is buildup of fluid or blood or hemorrhage, what's en what ends up happening is that you get compression of the neural tissue and hence death and uh, compromise to the neural function. Um, and it's usually fatal. We'll talk more about that. So just know the definition. It's the accumulation, okay? Don't memorize it by word, but rather understand what it means. Okay, we have two types of edema, rather more, okay? But the two main types of edema are vasogenic and cytotoxic. So in very brief terms, simple terms, vasogenic, you have a blood vessel surrounded by a blood-brain barrier. Whenever this barrier gets compromised, the fluid in the blood vessel will leak into the interstitium of the brain cells, okay? Now, usually in the interstitium, you have your neurons, your uh, oligodendrocytes, your astrocytes, microglia, and the fluid is gonna be between those cells, okay? And the opposite is, is true. When the fluid is not in the interstitium, but inside the cells, that's cytotoxic, so the cell ends up swelling. Now that you know the difference between those two, it's important to understand the causes, okay? So, as I said, so uh, cytotoxic fluid ends up inside the cell and the cell swells, uh, while uh, vasogenic, it's between the cells, okay? Very simple. So, um, vasogenic edema usually happens when the blood-brain barrier is disrupted. 
okay that's the most likely cause uh, of uh, vasogenic edema and this can be due to inflammation when you have inflammation bacteria or white blood cells acute inflammation all of that is going to destroy the blood brain barrier and hence fluid will leak into the interstitium other things such as toxic agents or whether there's malignancy or trauma these things will also leak fluid into the uh, into the interstitium these are the causes again um, of the same thing uh, high altitude with cerebral edema now usually when you have when you're in a high altitude you usually have low oxygen so you're going to get vasodilation of the cranial blood vessels so you're carrying more blood flow to the brain okay so chances are more blood will leak into the interstitium okay the keyword is the interstitium you should associate it with vasogenic okay now the main takeaway out of the this slide the ones we've discussed and the ones we will discuss is to know that the exact etiologies of vasogenic versus cytotoxic uh, edema okay now uh, this is the blood brain barrier as you know you have your endothelial cells you have your tight junctions here and you have your astrocytes forming these um, foot processes and it's important because it controls what gets in and out of the cell okay you should know that from your histology or physiology lectures again same thing when it leaks out that's vasogenic now for appearance it's important that you have an idea about these scans so t1 is a type of mri it has a certain characteristic T, t1 with gallodinium gallo, someone correct me on that um, but basically it's a metal okay that is used to visualize that's used to visualize arteries as you can see can, can you guys see this it's a small artery okay this indicates that the gallodinium or gd is inside the vessels when you have vasogenic we said that the fluid in the vessels is leaking into the interstitium so as you can see here, this is a case of brain cancer. Um, it, the brain cancer destroyed the blood-brain barrier and you end up with uh, GD leaking out, okay? Same here, okay? It shouldn't be. It should only be in the, in the uh, blood vessels, as you can see here, okay? Another type is flare. Flare is basically T2, but in T2 with attenuated CSF. I don't want you to know the details, okay? But as you can see, there is... Um, leakage here and leakage here okay now i'll teach you i'll teach you something to notice uh, since it's on two sides okay and it's not uh actually i'll explain it when we talk about cytotoxic because it will make better sense okay but for now know that gd when it leaks out that means that the fluid is no longer in the vessels and it's probably vasogenic edema okay um this is another picture all right. When it comes to cytotoxic, it's usually an intracellular phenomenon. The fluid will accumulate inside the cells, and it usually, most of the times, happens due to hypoxia. So when you see cytotoxic, you should probably think that it is, uh, it should cause cytotoxic edema because part of the cellular changes or neuronal changes which you should have taken in uh, your uh, pathology, the first step is cellular swelling, and that's what they mean by cytotoxic edema. Okay, um, it's due to several reasons, most likely due to the uh, sodium potassium pump failing. So what ends up happening is that the sodium accumulates inside the cells and it takes up all the water. Okay, we said that. Now, so what are the causes? Any cause that will cause ischemia, okay? Hemorrhage, uh, infarction, uh, hypothermia, cardiac arrest when the heart stops beating, okay? All of these will cause low oxygen this neuron will swell and this causes um, cytotoxic edema now this is an artery as you can see here and this artery is most likely thromposed and you get this area of infarction okay now the difference that i want you to notice when you look at the mri now i don't want you to know the details okay but what i want you to notice is that the cytotoxic carries a pattern that is similar to the part of the brain supplied by uh, the artery okay so let's i think i have a picture for it okay excellent so this is the brain artery uh, anatomy um, as you can see this is the anterior cerebral artery this is the middle cerebral artery posterior or inferior cerebral artery and all of these supply the brain in a certain pattern okay so when it comes to cytotoxic edema the 
edema will follow a pattern to the part of the brain supplied by the artery. Okay, so as you can see here, this is the part supplied by the middle cerebral artery. Okay, and when you compare that to, for instance, um, vasogenic, it's on two different parts. So you, there's a less likely chance that you have two arteries blocked. Um, it's not, so in this case, it should be the posterior cerebral artery. So it should be, if it was, for instance, uh, cytotoxic edema. So this entire area should be uh, visible as a change. And I hope that made sense. Uh, we said that the most important part for vasogenic edema is the T1GD enhanced MRI. Okay, know that. I think this is important. So T1 enhanced uh, uh, MRI with gallodinium is useful for vasogenic edema, while the apparent diffusion coefficient, and it's again, it's another type of MRI. But what ends up happening, so diffusion with uh, uh, MRI or ADC, it's a type of imaging that measures the fluid flow, okay, in between cells. Okay. When you have cellular swelling, this fluid is no longer moving, and hence it's more visible on DWI. I don't want you to know the physics of it because it's not part of your curriculum at all, but know that ADC is useful for cytotoxic edema. Okay, this is the second important fact in this lecture. Now, as you can see, it follows a certain pattern. Okay, look. So it tells you that it's supplied by an artery. Don't worry about it. You're not neuroradiologist, so, but have an idea. Okay, again, these are the arteries and it's usually due to ischemia. So why is it important to differentiate between those two? Um, well, it's because of the management. So the management of vasogenic involves putting, uh, so we said the blood is leaking, uh, the fluid is leaking out of the blood vessel into the interstitium. So the goal is to reduce that and get it back into the blood vessel. Now, usually this happens when you create a high concentration gradient, and this is done by hypertolic solutions such as mannitol. Mannitol creates a high concentration gradient and the fluid will go from the uh, interstitium back into the blood vessel or using 3% saline, as you know that normal saline or isotonic saline is 0.9%. So hypertonic saline will create a high concentration gradient and this will reduce the swelling. Okay, compared to cytotoxic, which chances are you can't do anything but to restore the blood flow. Tamam? Other types of edema. Now, when I want you to think about edema, honestly, the division is not, it's not black or white. It's more of gray, okay? Because they overlap. Everything overlap with, the, with, with each other, get me? So you might have both uh, cytotoxic, vasogenic, um, and these are other types of edema. So interstitial edema, when you have obstructive hydrocephalus, you have your ventriculomegaly here. Some of the fluid from the CSF leaks into the parenchyma, and hence you have your uh, edema of some sort, okay? So it's not, it's rather, it's not blood leaking, uh, fluid leaking from blood vessels, but rather from CSF fluid leaking to the interstitium due to high CSF. Again, they're not important. These are more examples. You can see they surround the um, ventricles, okay? Now, uh, usually when you have uh, edema, the brain is swelling, okay? And the, the skull or the cranial vault is made of blood vessels, the CSF, the, um, what else? The brain itself. So it's limited, okay? And any increase in pressure is gonna cause herniation and herniation will end up in causing death, okay? along with hypoxia. So if you have hypoxia of the neural tissue, you lose its function. So it's important to manage it and to understand it really well, okay? Again, we said it's because the brain is a closed space. It does not have lymphatics to drain it. So that's why you need to manage it immediately. Now, signs of increased um, intracranial pressure include headache. You will have headache, vomiting. These are non-specific because they come with other diseases. But one interesting sign is papilledema, and I'll show you papilledema in a bit. Uh, basically, it means that the optic disc, because of the increased intracranial pressure, it will bulge out into the orbit, okay? Or uh, intraocular space, tamam? Uh, so these are the content of the cranium but the cranium has limited space, okay? 
Uh, this is papilledema. You can see bulging of the optic disc. It looks like a donut. It's important that you recognize this sign because it helps you understand that there is increased intracranial pressure. And this is an important thing to do, okay? Now, as I said, so um, as the intracranial pressure increases, the intracranial volume will increase and it increases very fast when the intracranial pressure is very high, okay? Same thing. So the normal intracranial pressure is from 15 to 20, and it incre causes of it increasing if you had a tumor, if you had edema, as we talked about, if you had hydrocephalus, if you had hemorrhage, all of these are different causes of increased intracranial pressure, and you should manage them accordingly. Um, again, this is the same thing. Now, one important, let's talk about physiology a little bit. So I drew this, excuse me for the drawing, but it's because I drew it on a trackpad. So basically you have your heart, your heart is pumping with systolic pressure and your diastolic pressure. The average between those is called your mean arterial pressure, okay? And it's going to the brain. This mean arterial pressure is going to the brain. The intracranial pressure creates a force that opposes this mean arterial pressure. And the overall, overall sum of these vectors is gonna be the cerebral perfusion, okay? Now it's important that your brain is perfused with blood. So when you have increased intracranial pressure, it will there will come a point where it's higher than the mean arterial, not higher, or can be higher, but it will come a point where it's so high that the cerebral perfusion is no longer meets the demand. And hence you will have neuronal death, okay? So it's important that you're familiar with this concept. So the cerebral perfusion is the difference between mean arterial pressure and the intracranial pressure, okay? So what, So let's take it from the beginning. When you have increased intracranial pressure, the first thing that's gonna end up happening is vasoconstriction. So you will have vasoconstriction to decrease the blood flow to the brain. And hence, this is a mechanism of trying to reduce brain herniation, okay? Because brain herniation causes death. But it eventually ends up failing and you get more um, intracranial pressure the vasoconstriction will cause ischemia, causing edema, worsening the intracranial pressure. And then again, we said cytotoxic edema. Um, you have different manifestations, Chinese stock breathing. It's a certain pattern of breathing, which indicates a brainstem uh, compromise. Bradycardia makes sense. Pupils get involved if you have uh, cranial nerve nuclei involved and you need to intervene immediately, okay? So um, again, high rise will cause uh, edema and the edema will worsen the intracranial pressure. So it's, it's sort of a loop, okay? And if you don't manage it very fast, you're gonna get death very soon, okay? As I said, it's some sort of loop. You have neuronal injury, it swells, it increases the cranial pressure, decreasing the blood flow, which, is high. So when you have increase in the uh, in the intracranial pressure, you have you're risking four types of hernia. Actually, three. This is if he had a surgery prior to the uh, to the increase in the intracranial pressure. And it's important that you recognize how each presents. Okay. So this is from your first aid. It's important that you know them. So you have your cingulate uh, or subfalcine herniation which occurs under the phallic cerebri. So you have this part of the brain, it just herniates to the other side. Now, when this happens, you have your um, anterior cerebral artery on this side and it will get compressed. Now, as you know, the anterior cerebral artery will uh, supply this part of the brain, okay? And hence you'll get symptoms of loss of sensation on the contralateral side, weakness on the contralateral side. So symptoms of, anterior cerebral artery compromise. This is an important slide, and this is the third thing I talk about that is important in this lecture. Um, the other type of herniation is transtentorial herniation. Uh, basically, it's the displacement of the brainstem. I'll show you this in a bit. I'll show you this in better details uh, in the next slide. Uh, uncle herniation, this is uh, very bad because it can result in coma when the uncus goes down under the trans... Uh, um, and the tentor what is it called? Tentorium cereb uh, cerebelli, okay? So when that happens, you have epsilateral uh, pupil affected, 
later it will become contralateral, but I don't want you to know that. And then you will have coma, okay? So uh, if you've watched your favorite TV series, medical series, you probably see them checking the pupils. And that's usually why most brain injury occurs because of increased intracranial pressure and they want to check for that. Um, and then the worst, worst one which causes death is the herniation of the cerebellar tonsils through the foramen magnum. And this causes death, okay? Because it presses on the brainstem. As I said, I will talk about the transtentorial, uh, central transtentorial herniation. So uh, this is your basilar artery. And the basilar artery usually continues to supply the circle of Willis. This is the uh, middle cerebral artery. And in the circle of Willis, it's held by the brain. When you have a uh, pressure, increased intracranial pressure, it will press down on the brain stem, uh, pushing the ba basilar artery down with it, okay? However, the basilar artery is held by the circle of Willis. What ends up happening is that all these pontine arteries from the basilar artery get teared, and this is this causes direct hemorrhages. This is relatively important, and I think you should know that, okay? These are all the possible questions that can come. Um, now let's talk about idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So this happens when you have uh, increased intracranial pressure, but we don't know why, because it's idiopathic. Um, there are different presentations uh, of it, but it presents with symptoms, as we said, of increased intracranial pressure. So headache, uh, tinnitus, if the cranial nerve 8 is affected, um, visual symptoms. Uh, but the most important one is papilledema. You should be familiar with that. Uh, the visual field can be compromised along with the visual acuity, uh, and the there might be abdus and paresis. I don't want you to know this. Just know that uh, papilledema is a sign of increased uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension. And leave the rest for later. How can you measure it? So, you know, when you do a lumbar puncture, the first thing you assess is the opening pressure. The opening pressure correlates with the intracranial pressure because, you know, it's a system. And I'll show you the anatomy of it. And this gives you a hint along with the fundoscopy that shows papilledema. And then you can, there are some changes that you can see on CT. So this is the orbit. And when you compare this optic nerve to this one, you can see that this is the optic nerve and it's surrounded by edema, okay? And it's a sign of uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Know it, okay? Keep it in the back of your mind, but it's not I mean, life or death, okay? Um, now, the risk factors are relatively important. If I was the clinician, I'd probably ask about this. So it's seen in young women, and the, the uh, people are usually obese, and they have headaches, okay? So these two, are very important, okay? I've seen them in practice. And um, that's it, you've known, you know the uh, signs. Now it can present as various signs, so it's not a checklist per se, but it's the most important one is papilledema. The rest might or not be there, okay? So the goal is to preserve vision and to alleviate the symptoms. So they try to divert the CSF to uh, the uh, to increase uh, to decrease the uh, intracranial pressure, they might give drugs drugs that decrease CSF production. If there is a cause, they remove it, and they aim for weight loss because we said obesity is a risk factor. Okay, so carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. Now acetazolamide or carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, they are thought to decrease the uh, CSF production. The mechanism is not important. Diuretics because you're decreasing the fluid overall, think of it that way. So you're decreasing intracranial pressure. If you do lumbar punctures uh, again and again, but I promise you, if you read up on the literature, this is probably, this does not work. Um, corticosteroids, uh, if there is inflammation of some sort that is causing the intracranial pressure, and then um, you can put a shunt, okay, to decrease the CSF. So all of these, uh, we'll tie them in with the physiology. So as you know here uh, that the granulations in the uh, sagittal sinus, these are what drain the CSF, okay? There's a certain criteria, but it's not important. 
now, as you know, there is they say that it's because of increased CSF production. So what, what, why does it happen? They say it's because increased CSF production, they, some link it to the elasticity, some link it to decreased outflow, but I don't think this is important because these are all hypotheses and we don't have anything for certain, okay? Uh, you should be familiar with the CSF drainage. So it's produced by the choroid plexus. It flows to the third ventricle, then through the aqueductal sylvius to the fourth ventricle, then through the uh, uh, foramen of Mijendi and Lushka, I think. It's Lushka, yes. It goes to the um, uh, dural space or subdural space in the spine and the uh, brain. And then it goes through the granulation into the sagittal sinus where it gets rained. Any obstruction in this can cause um, hydrocephalus and then cause brain herniation, okay? So the treatment, as I said, for idiopathic intracranial hypertension is to decrease CSF production or increase drainage or um, basically to decrease the intracranial pressure, okay? This is the arachnoid villi, we said that. Risk factors, we've said that. Obesity and female gender are very important. They will probably ask you about this. Um, conclusions, that's not important. So I'm gonna summarize this lecture really quickly to tell you the main points that you should take away, but I hope that I explained everything. Um, so let's go back, okay. So uh, it's just gonna take five minutes. I'm go gonna all go over the slides. So know the difference between vasogenic and uh, toxigenic by definitions and then by imaging and causes. So cytotoxic is probably due to ischemia. Just know that, or hypoxia, okay? If you're good with the images, know these, because the doctor will probably use the same images in the exam if he brings them. I don't think he will. Know the, uh, the modalities that are used. So ADC and DYI are used in uh, cytotoxic, or the other one is used in vasogenic. Um, know that the brain has certain mechanisms to prevent intracranial pressure increase, and a sign of intracranial pressure is papilledema. Um, so these are the mechanisms and how it happens. It's not important. Um, know that it's a circular cascade, but you know, the key, it's hard to ask about. This, this slide is extremely important, okay? Know the herniations and the signs. Um, this is an example of the red hemorrhages. And know about intracranial, uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension, which is due to, uh, which is linked to, sorry, female gender and obesity. Know that papilledema is a sign of intracranial, uh, increased intracranial pressure. And some about something about the treatment modalities. That's it. It's a simple lecture. I hope it made sense. Let's check the comments. Do we need to? put emphasis on this each of the stage? No, not at all. Because there are way more important things that he can ask. Well, the stages only say, by the way, the stages only mention what happens. And it's it's the same thing, okay? So you have uh, increased intracranial pressure, vasoconstriction, causing edema, causing more intracranial pressure, causing more vasoconstriction, and it's a cycle. If you take that away, that's the most important part. Would you mind repeating the mean arterial pressure and the Yes, sure. So just know that, where is my drawing? So you have your heart here. It's pumping blood at a certain rate. That's your mean arterial pressure. And the intracranial pressure opposes that, okay? And what the mean arterial pressure is so strong that you have perfusion to the brain, okay? But sometimes when you have edema or you have uh, increased intracranial pressure due to tumors, hemorrhage, or infection, any cause, the intracranial pressure will be so high that it will overcome the mean arterial pressure. And when that happens, you don't have perfusion to the brain, and this causes ischemia. This is for you to understand the physiology of it. That's it. But uh, he can't ask you about it. It's hard. Any more questions? Because we, uh, we're done with the lecture. I hope that made sense. Please approach clinical lectures easily and try to focus on the main points and hopefully it will all make sense at the end. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.